Thank you, and we are so excited that so many of you have joined us today. Just before we get started with our talk, we'd like to go through uh, a few housekeeping kinds of, of issues to make sure that we can make this session as enjoyable for you as possible. I'm just going to ask our WebEx producer to provide the uh, control. So as you start to join us, maybe as a class, a chapter, individually, we do want to let you know that the webinar is interactive. We want to uh, make sure that you have opportunities to ask questions, and we'd also like to find out some information for you as we move through, through the webinar. So in order to join us on the interactive activities we have planned, we'd like to encourage you to join via your computer or using your cell phone or tablet via the WebEx app. If you have questions on how to download or set up the app, feel free to submit your questions and a WebEx staff member will assist you. We also want to mention that we have an evaluation survey at the end of the webinar. Please take the time to fill out the survey because it really helps us as organizers try to provide future virtual undergraduate town halls that are really oriented at what you're interested in. So we would really appreciate your responses to the survey. In fact, at any time, feel free to send us your questions throughout the presentation. You don't have to wait until the designated time when we ask for questions. And you will always be asking your questions through the Q&A panel. You'll be typing them in, and we'll make sure that you either get a response live during the session or as a private response after the end of the webinar. At the end of the webinar, we will also be having a chat session that we encourage you to take part of in case you have a, more questions that you would like to ask our speaker and others. Now, some of you may have already found the poll section of the WebEx app. If you haven't, please take a look at the lower right-hand side of your screen. There's currently an open-ended poll question that we're displaying on the slide. And so you can take a look at it and try and understand what the question might be, and we would really encourage you to respond to these questions as they come up, because it helps our speaker actually orient the presentation to much more of what you're actually interested in. So watch for those polls to come up, and uh, you'll be able to, to give us some feedback about how you're interpreting the information and allow us to tailor the session more to you. So with all of that housekeeping, let's get into the actual content. Uh, I'll briefly just give you an idea of who I am, and then I am really excited to be able to introduce Yun Shu Du to you. I am Gail Murphy. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of British Columbia, and I'm soon going to be starting as vice president of research and innovation at UBC. My own research focuses on software engineering, with a particular interest in, interest in looking at the productivity of knowledge workers. I'm the moderator for this event because I'm also a CRAW board member, and of course, organizing these town hall events with Lori Pollack. With that, let me introduce Yunshu Du. Yunshu is a third year PhD student in the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Washington State University. Yunshu attended the 2017 grad cohort in April, where she presented her research to her peers, as well as to CRAW speakers, board members, and other senior level computer scientists. We're really thrilled to have Yunshu here to tell us about her research, which is in an area that we hear a lot about in the popular press in terms of reinforcement learning and artificial intelligence. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Yunshu and, and hear more about her research. Thank you, Gail. Um, do I have the ball now? Looks like so. All right. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Ying Shu. I'm very happy to be here today to tell you about my research in deep reinforcement learning. And uh, before that, let me introduce myself a little bit. So I was born and raised in a city called Wuhan in China, and Wuhan is the capital city of Hubei province in China. And it has a nickname called the Chicago of China because both cities have um, very similar industry in China. Uh, if you ever have a chance to go visit, which 
you should at some point. Uh, there are some must seen places like the one called the Yellow Crane Tower, which is the tall building here. It was uh, built back in the 18th century, and there's quite a view if you stand at the top of the tower and look down. You can see the whole city. And uh, another thing I really like is uh, go to the Bay of Yangtze River, the longest river in China. It flows through Wuhan, and uh, Wuhan is where those branches start to merge and goes to the Pacific Ocean. So it's really beautiful at the Bay Area. So I came to the U.S. in 2012, and I went to Eastern Michigan University to study computer science and got my bachelor's degree in 2014. So uh, my chance that I developed, I would like to come here to study is from a short visit I had uh, in 2009 in Texas. And it was then I experienced the U.S. cultures and how the campus life is like, and I decided I, I want to come back. So I did. After two years at Eastern Michigan University, I went uh, joined WSU right after I graduated from uh, EMU. Because uh, one reason I went directly to grad school is that um, I really enjoyed teaching and I want to become a faculty in a university in my later career. So I figured I have to do a PhD. So because I really like computer science, so I'll continue in this path. And now I was doing my PhD program with my advisor, Dr. Matt Taylor, is this friendly looking guy here at the right corner. So in our lab, the Intelligent Robot Learning Lab, our main focus is reinforcement learning and its branches. And we're also doing a ton of work at uh, robotics and um, algorithmic. Um, everyone else in our lab, you can see this picture, that's all of our lab members. Uh, everyone is doing a slightly different uh, research so that there's always fun flowing inside this lab. And uh, for me, besides the main research I'm doing for reinforcement learning, I also have a uh, direct direction of interest in the field of applied data science, which I will talk a little bit more about in later in the mentor part. So let's get into with my topic today. You will learn about a lot of learning today. So I'll first uh, start with uh, some basic uh, concept of AI and machine learning, and then tell you what is reinforcement learning and how deep reinforcement learning comes in. And lastly is my research on how do I use transfer learning and multitask learning so that the RL can learn much better. Uh, so before that, here's your first four questions. When someone say artificial intelligence to you, what is your first impression on that? Um, you can select the one that's closest to your understanding of AI. So I, I've heard uh, many different opinions about AI. If you're a big fan of those Hollywood movies, you probably have seen those, like Terminators, where they build AI that's bad and evil and trying to destroy your world. But actually, AI is um, everywhere in our daily life right now. If you have an iPhone, we probably know the function of the Siri where you can talk directly to it and it can help you with uh, daily life things. And maybe the spam email detection in your email system, that's also AI, or the robot vacuum that can clean your home automatically. So AI is really um, in our daily life. But in the academic field, the definition of an artificial uh, intelligence is one of the goal is that we're trying to build an intelligent agent which can interact with an environment that's, um, that it has never seen before. So the agent should be able to perceive what's going on in the environment and process what it has seen and take actions inside this environment so that it can succeed in an unknown environment. So we want the agent to be able to learn and adapt. So learning is important because we won't see the first. Uh, we won't see the exact same situation twice again. So whenever you see an unanticipated situation, you want your agent to be able to learn and adapt. You don't have to um, program it from scratch. And the second thing is, if we have an agent that's already learned, we can just reapply it to a new question, and it will make it faster for human programming to do things. And eventually, we would want the agent to be better than human programmers and make it easier for normal user, users without CS background to be able to use it. 
So learning is quite important there. So there are many ways that you can achieve AI. Machine learning is one of many approaches that you can achieve AI. Sometimes I get questions like um, people are a little confused about uh, is machine learning and AI the same thing? Um, what I can say is machine learning is one way that you can do AI. There are other ways like uh, from the statistical literatures, um, which I'm not going to talk about. So inside machine learning, there are three main branches about machine learning called supervised learning, unsupervised learning. Um, I will not go into details today. And my topic today is on the third branch of machine learning called reinforcement learning. So let's first look at some basic components of reinforcement learning. So it was first inspired by behavior psychology, which means uh, when we observe that one's behavior will be encouraged if you give it um, if you give it a positive feedback. Uh, if you give it a negative feedback, a little punishment, one's behavior might be discouraged. So for a reinforcement learning agent, we have an agent that explores an environment and you're trying to decide what action you can take in the environment. And the environment we represent it by what we call a state here. So inside this action, agent tries to take action in this environment and the environment will give it a feedback as a reward signal to the agent, telling the agent if the action you just took was correct or not, uh, was good or bad, not correct. Um, and then the agent will do it over and over again, go into the next state, take a next action, get a next reward. So if you do this from time to time, you're going to get a series of state action reward and next state. This is going to form what we call a Markov decision process. And that means everything in an RL problem is in a sequential order. The goal for an RL agent is to find an optimal policy so that the agent can maximize the reward it accumulated. So let me take a really simple example to tell you what do I mean by maximize reward for optimal policy. Let's take a look at dog training. So I have a golden retriever at home. He's almost seven. He's such a sweetheart. But if I want to teach him a command, say, lie down, how am I going to do that? So let's assume the action he can take is either go up, go down, or stay still, do nothing. And if he's starting from a standing position and wants to go to the lying down position, he will bypass in the sitting position. And to go to the lie down position, he needs to do two down movements. If he does things right by going down, I'll give him one of his favorite cookies. But if he did the opposite by going up, I'll remove the cookie from his ball as a punishment. And if he's, he's still and don't uh, stay still and don't do anything, I'll just simply not give him any rewards again. So what do you think he will behave? And of course, he will do his best to earn as much cookie as possible. So maybe at the beginning, he doesn't know what to do, and nothing happens. And then he decides to explore the uh, outcomes of, what if I try to move down and go sitting? That's correct. So one cookie earn. If he tries to go, uh, then if he stays still for a while, no cookie. And if he goes up, I'll remove the cookie, and then he will realize that going up is not the action I want him to do. So it's better for him just keep going down and earn another cookie. He doesn't want to move up. And if I do that for from time to time, he will finally be able to learn that going down is the action he needs to do given the current situation. So his optimal policy for earning as much cookie as possible is by going down and going down and stay lay down. That will give him a lot of cookies, but usually I don't feed him that much because he's a little overweight. So here is what we call a policy. It's a state action mapping. It tells you what action should I do given my current state so that I can earn as much reward as possible. So from what I've just told you, uh, which of the following do you think is an RL agent? You can think of it in terms of if there's an interaction between the agent and environment, if there's a reward signal, and um, uh, how, do, how would an agent take into account of the reward signal. Okay. 
So moving on, just now I give you a really simple example on dog training with only three states and three actions. And we all know that in reality, training a dog is not just that simple because he might do some other actions that you're not expected. So what if for a problem, you have a really complex state space? For example, the game of Go. It has 90 by 90 board size and the state space is 10 to the um, 172. And in this case, we will not be able to search every single state like what I just did. So the state space is going to be this huge. Oh, okay, I just saw the poll answer comes in. Um, I'd like to recap that a little bit. Uh, so most people choose A, movie recommendation system on Netflix, and uh, very few said B, and some said C. So um, in a movie recommendation system, it can be an RL agent, depends on if you will give it a feedback. So if you look at uh, what you're watching and give a recommendation, that is the agent taking action. But if you're not telling it if you like those recommendations or not, there will be no reward signal. So it won't be an RL agent. But if you do tell it, I do not like your recommendation, I'd like to see something else, that's a reward signal. That will form an RL problem. So the second one, of course, is not an RL agent because there is no learning involved. Although the parameter will be able to display temperature as it changes, but there is, um, it won't learn what the future is going to like, and it won't adapt itself based on some other information. So the second one is not an RO agent. So the third one uh, indeed is an RO agent because the robot is navigating your room, which is your environment, and finding where uh, places that needs to be clean. So if it's clean or not can be a reward signal. So I think uh, most people did a really good job. Okay, continue on uh, this question on what if you have a problem that has really large uh, state. Uh, to deal with this large state problem, we'll use a concept called function approximator. So instead of enumerate every single state you have and search them one by one, you will use a function that make approximation of what your state is. Um, an easy way to interpret this FA is um, like your eyes looking at something and the input from your eyes going inside your brain and your brain is going to process the information you see into some other format that your body can't understand and then eventually output an action you should say you should um, take say wave your hand and that will bring us to the uh, idea of deep learning if you can approximate where you're at with your brain, then an agent will process those information and approximate its state using a deep neural network. So when using a deep neural network as function approximators, those, uh, those approximations will be represented by uh, features. So you will extract different features from your state and given your original input, passing multiple hidden layers and eventually output to your output layer which corresponds to what actions you should take. So inside the neural network, it's associate, associated with different weights. And inside these weights, you're going to do mathematical computations to transform from your input to your output layer. I'm not going to go into the details on how this computation happens, but there is a really great resource that I want to point out is the Stanford uh, convolutional neural network research and recommendation class. Every material is online, you can find it really easily. And that's actually um, my starting point when I get into deep learning. So I highly recommend you to look it up. So after knowing the reinforcement learning and deep learning, when it comes to a deep reinforcement learning, it's really just um, you're plugging in any kind of RL algorithms with a deep neural network as function approximator. Uh, and one of the pioneers in this field is Google DeepMind, where they have done a lot of great works in uh, apply deep RL in different kinds of problems. From the very first one called DeepQ Network, short for DQN, until the very recent one, AlphaGo, I think some of you might have heard of it. 
uh, this program defeated the world's number one professional Go player. So I think those are really impressive. So my research lies on the first one, the DeepQ network, where I aim to make those networks can learn better. So uh, some background on the DQN. The DQN is an um, algorithm that was designed for Atari game playing. If you've ever played one, I played a few when I was young. And um, this algorithm is able to learn and master 49 different Atari games directly from game scripts. It's like given an agent and it has the eyes to see and understand how to learn it. This is really impressive for AI and it was one of the breakthroughs in this field of study. And what's more amazing is that it even beats human experts in half of those games. And the DQN network uh, is using the combination of Q-learning, one of the R algorithm, with convolutional neural networks. So the Q-learning, um, the idea of Q-learning is in the output layer, you will output a Q value for each of the actions you have, and the agent will simply choose the action that has the highest Q value. And convolutional neural network is one type of deep neural network too. It was designed to extract features from image input. So if we look at the architecture of DQN, uh, you are given the input of Atari game. And while the game is playing, you will accumulate a bunch of uh, screenshots. And then it will input the screenshot in, into the convolutional layers and the convolutional layers will extract the features from those pictures. And then it will connect to a fully connected layer. It's also a type of neural network. And eventually output Q values for each action that's available inside the game. For example, if I'm playing Breakout and I see this current image and passing through the neural network and I found that the action going to the right has the highest Q value. So that means in this image, I should do going to the right. So if I tell you that everything in deep learning is automatic, all you have to do is give it an image and input it into a bunch of neural networks and it will give you the output you want, do you think you can trust its outcome? Do you think you will use it in real life, say, we want to use a deep learning algorithm to control my traffic? just feeding it into some historical traffic data, and it tells me what to do in the future. Do you think it's trustworthy? Okay, so continue on the DQN. Although DQN is pretty amazing in learning to play Atari games, uh, it does have its um, weaknesses. One problem is that for an R algorithm, it's known to be unstable in learning if we are using neural networks. So unstable would mean the behavior of the agent is, um, it can be sometimes can be really bad and sometimes it's really good. And the reason that might cause is because, um, okay, I see, uh, I have the poll question results coming out. Most people would like B. I think I would go with um, option B as well. Because I think if you have this great tool, uh, we can certainly use it in some circumstances if it's not life or death. But if it's really serious, like uh, identifying someone have really serious disease, I probably won't use it because I don't know if I can trust the result it gives me. And uh, quite a few people said like C, uh, so use it under, under human supervision. I think that's also good choices. And someone say A. Well, I, I still think it depends on what problem you're trying to solve. Okay, continue on this. Um, so I said uh, learning using neural network for RL agent is unstable, and DQN uses a few tricks to solve this problem, and one of the main solutions is called experience replay memory, where it says, I do not learn as it goes, but I save whatever I, I saw and use it for later learning. So say you have a game that is playing, and I do not do any learning just yet, but I store all the images I've seen. And later on, when it enters the learning part, I will pause the game and randomly pick a set of experience from a memory 
and then input it into your network. The benefit of doing so is to um, remove, because if you have a ball that's only bouncing at the left corner of the screen, then the agent might not know what to do once the ball goes to the right side. So this way, by randomly pick, you're more likely to see the entire picture of your uh, learning so that the learning can see everything so it's stabilized. So when the, uh, we just, just keep adding experience memory to it, and when it gets full, you just kick out the older memory and add a new memory. So that way it helps stabilize the learning and make the learning more efficient because you can use one picture for many times. So uh, another main problem that a lot of researchers are trying to tackle right now is deep RL is really slow in learning. From my experience, if I want to train them to learn one game, it takes about 10 days to learn in a very decent GPU. And this can be problematic in real world because, uh, say, in a scenario where you want to train a program to drive a car, if it can behave stabilized at the very beginning, you might crash the car and cause some serious damage. So now it comes to my research of solving this slow learning problem. I do it in two ways. One is called a transfer learning, and the other is called multitask learning. Transfer learning means you will leverage your knowledge you've learned before so that you can learn a new task faster. And multitask learning is you will do multiple things at the same time so that you're more efficient. So to perform transfer learning in the DQN algorithms, the first thing we need to do is do a task selection, where we have a source task and a target task. Source task is the task you have already learned, and target task is something that you want to learn. And usually when we do this task selection, we just pick them by hand, by uh, look at if two, two tasks are visually similar. So for example, here I pick breakout and pawn as my task pair because they are really uh, like bouncing a pedal, for, uh, bouncing a ball using a pedal. And I also applied another small trick to make it even more similar by rotating the pawn's image so that they're both uh, horizontal. So to perform transfer, the key point is to do the weight transfer. Remember in the neural network uh, pictures I showed that there are weights connected inside the network. So we will perform this kind of weight transfer in both ways, breakout to pawn and pawn to breakout. So let's say if we first use pawn as source task and breakout as target task, I will perform the weight transfer. So uh, look more closely inside. Let's say if we pick to transfer the weights from W0 and W1 to the breakout weights W0 and W1. And after transfer, I'm going to continue train breakout to, uh, to fine tune those weights, to uh, adapt those weights into the environment of breakout. And then I'm going to perform transfer in all the convolutional layers because CNN are designed to extract features from your image. So the other, for the other direction, we'll use breakout source and pawn as target and do a similar way transfer. So to evaluate if the transfer is successful, we'll use um, three standards. One is called Jumpstart, and the other is Final Performance, and then lastly, Total Reward. So let's look at what that those mean. So uh, this is the um, baseline performance for, uh, for breakout, where the X exit, it means how many episodes I've trained those. And one, uh, every five episodes contains 1.25 million steps. So that's a very long time because it learns slower. And the Y axis is the reward it gets. So if we transfer the first layer from uh, pawn to breakout, we will see that the purple line here uh, goes higher than the red line. So to evaluate Jumpstart, we should see uh, that the uh, purple point should be higher than the red point here. Although in this scenario, we do not see a, a significant jump start here. And for final performance, the final accumulated reward in transfer breakout should be better than the baseline breakout, which is what we see here. And the total reward means the area under the curve. So this area of red 
is not as much as the area of purple, so we know that the total, total reward of transfer is better than the baseline. So continue applying this to different layers. If we add transfer two layers in the blue line and transfer three layers in the green line, you can see that all the results outperform the baseline, which is good. And uh, similar, uh, similar results shows in plain pong where we see the baseline is under all transfer agents. So we see that transfer has been quite successful here. And then when we do multitask learning, it's uh, really similar as the pro uh, process of transfer learning. First, we have to perform task selection by hand uh, to select similar game. In my experience, I continue to use breakout and pawn. But uh, the modification comes into the DQN's architecture so that we can enable multiple game input because the original one is a single game input. So first, I'm going to take out the last uh, action layer and split it into two, one for breakout and one for pawn. And when I'm learning for one game, say breakout, I'm going to cover the branches for pawn and letting the breakout only go through the left branches. And when I'm learning pawn similarly, I'll cover the breakout part and letting Pong only learn on the right branch. So there are a few design choices you have to uh, decide when you do multitask learning. The first thing comes in is how often should you switch each game. Like I mentioned, everything happens in a sequential order. You have to decide if you should have breakout learn one step and then switch right to Pong and then breakout, or you want to switch them maybe every 10,000 steps, or you want to train one game until, say, a breakout agent die and then switch to pawn. That's uh, a consideration to make. And the second is um, both games will have experience replay memory stored, and should those memories be shared or not? And the third will be at what point should the original network be split? I can split from the action layer, or I will split the fully connected layer, or I will start splitting at the convolutional layer. So based on these design choices, uh, we'll evaluate uh, using final performance and total reward because there is uh, no transfer, so no jump start involved. So first, we'll I design experience to see um, how often should we switch each game and should we share experience memory or not. Um, so in this set of experiments, I have set uh, the switch frequency to be every single step. And uh, the yellow line means I do not share their memory, and brown line means I do share their memory. And a next set of experiments, uh, I have them switch less frequent, so switch every 1,250 steps uh, with share memory or not share memory. So it looks like uh, from the empirical result, we can see that um, looks like switching more frequent, that switch every step seems better. So if you look at the yellow line here, uh, it performs best in both games. And in terms of experience replay, not sharing the experience replay seems better for both games. And the third question is, at what point should we start splitting the network? So I designed experience that I either split from the fully connected layer, the purple line here, split from the second convolutional layer, the green line here, and split from the first convolutional layer. So. Uh, Looks like the baseline is still the uh, red line, and looks like if we split at higher level, which means there are more sharing between two games, seems more beneficial in breakout because the look at the purple line is the highest, but wow, is the worst for for pong here. And uh, we actually see a really interesting phenomenon that if one game is improving, the other game seems to be damaged. So that implies some um, connections between these two games. So uh, just a quick recap. Uh, transfer learning and multitask learning from our experiments here shows a potential that the uh, deep RL algorithm can be speed up. But like I mentioned, that um, those results are empirical, and we see different uh, performance of uh, if we have different design choices, but we're not certain why at this moment. So this empirical result, we're actually not very solid to draw, uh, to draw a conclusion. So there's definitely more 
needs to be done. And people are also working on trying to understand what's actually going on inside your neural network. So for my future study plan, uh, first I need to test those uh, techniques in more domains. For example, in Atari games, some other experiments I've tried, I noticed that it does not always help, um, and we're not, uh, we're not sure why that's happening. And the second interesting domain we can do is to apply those techniques in a continuous control problem like uh, control uh, car driving in a simulation. And the second uh, big direction will be how do we do knowledge selection for each layer? Like we see in this previous performance, if one's performance is better, the other is worse. That demonstrates some connections, but we don't know what connection that is. So we need to figure out what knowledge are inside each game and see if we can select the knowledge that's specific, uh, useful for each other. And the third one will be um, that I mentioned, we do source and target test selection simply by hand. If there is an algorithm, algorithm that can pick those automatically, and how to measure the similarity between games, and if we can automate the selection process, we're hoping that uh, we can choose games that's more similar, therefore easier to perform a transfer or multitasking. So that's uh, my talk on the research part, and I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Yang Shu. That was that was totally awesome. I think I, I learned a lot about reinforcement learning. So we <laughs> invite the audience to put any questions that they have into the uh, into the Q and A box, and we'll either get them asked here or we'll get them asked and answered a little bit later. Um, here's one question for you, Yang Shu. Mm -hmm. Where do you see deep reinforcement learning being used in the future in our day-to-day -day lives, in our community, and in the classroom? I think um, it can pretty much be applied in anywhere. Because uh, right now, from uh, if I look online, some blogs, and people are trying to use deep reinforcement learning in all circumstances, like the one I had in the polling question, using deep RL for traffic control. It's actually something that people are looking into right now. Um, and for learning other circumstances, um, there are people using it for weather forecasting, or there are people use it to uh, predict how crowded a place will be. So I think it's really ap applicable to uh, many daily circumstances, depends on how you can frame this problem. You can, If you can find a problem and frame them into you have an environment and what is your goal and you can design a reward signal. I think it's it's very applicable to a wide range of problems. And here's another question. Um, we've got a question about what classes should someone take to learn more about deep reinforcement learning or multitask learning? Where where might others get started? Oh, so for the class, uh, the one I mentioned during my talk that the one uh, with Stanford called Convolutional Neural Network for uh, visual recognition. That is a very good starting point. And also there are tons of online class resources like Udacity. They have uh, Introduction to Machine Learning, Introduction to Reinforcement Learning, and there's a class called Deep Learning as well. And I've taken all those classes and I found those really useful. Awesome. So it sounds like there's some online courses. Maybe there's courses. Yeah, that there, there are tons of online resources if you if you want to learn about it. Or right, you can well, just go to YouTube and search deep reinforcement learning, and there will be a lot of lectures there. Even better. Yeah. <laughs> one last question before we move on to our mentoring section. You mm -hmm. talked a little bit about where reinforcement learning might be appropriate and where it might not be appropriate. So one of our one of our listeners is asking that. Um, Elon Musk has talked about AI safety, but mm -hmm. other people like Mark Zuckerberg think AI should be really unrestricted. Where do you kind of come down on where it could, should be used and where maybe it shouldn't be? Oh, that's um, that's quite interesting. So for I think for AI where we shouldn't be uh, used, like the AI security is also a big um, discussion right now. And some people would think uh, we can't trust AI because especially for the deep learning um, method because we do not really know what's actually going on inside the neural network. And then we don't know how the agent come up with the result. So I think in uh, circumstances where it's um, like life or death, 
you should probably not completely trust it. Say if you want to identify if someone is having a disease, you should probably have a real doctor to look at it instead of feeding them into an agent. Um, but besides that, I think uh, in other situations that's not uh, that does not have very serious consequences related, we should definitely give it a, a try. And the worry about AI security um, from the people around me, like my friends talk to me, their main worry comes from uh, those characters in the movie say the AI is sort of super intelligent and it's going to destroy our lives. Uh, from that point of view, I can tell you that there's nothing to worry about. AI for now in real life are still kind of... Um, not so intelligent, so they will not take over the world. So I say, there's nothing to worry about it for now. So I guess we can sleep well tonight, at least for now. Yep. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for that. Let's actually, I know you have a really interesting set of uh, perspectives on how to choose a research direction as an undergrad. And I think because it's summer, we have a lot of undergrads, of course, joining us. So I'd really think right now, let's move on to the mentoring session and uh, hear a little bit about your perspectives on what directions people might look into. Okay, cool. So uh, before I start talking, I'd like to know a little bit background of our audience today. Um, have you participated in any undergrad research opportunities? And you can choose the one that's, uh, that suits you the best. So for um, this part of my talk, first I would assume that you have already know how uh, to participate in research, and maybe you have side of mind say, I want to do the research, but only having difficulty picking a research project. So if you don't know how to participate in undergrad research yet, it's all okay. We have uh, two previous uh, virtual town hall sessions that talk about it, and they're all really great resources, and I recommend you to check it out. So I will try to uh, give you some uh, tips on what things you should consider when you try to pick your research project, either during a semester or during a summertime. So first I will talk about how did I end up in my current direction, and then I'll follow by a mini discussion panel uh, with our current undergrad researchers. I invited uh, two very, um, I invited two current undergrad researchers in our department to share with you about their research being at WSU during this summer. And then we will cover how can you find this project and what will you expect if you're doing a summer research and other things that you can consider when you pick your research direction. So here is the timeline of my direction changes. It's actually quite a zigzag process. So I started with a major of software engineering when I was still back in China, and I picked that major is because I took an um, entry-level programming class and realized I really enjoyed it, and software engineering is really close to. Um, I will have the opportunity to do some programming, and I really like it. So when I picked that major, I didn't think too much about if I can find a job with it or if I'll make a lot of money out of it. So I just simply did the things that um, I liked to do back then. So it was a uh, relatively easier decision for me to make. And then I mentioned I went to um, Eastern Michigan University in 2012. Um, that's an uh, exchange program I took, uh, I took a chance of at my Chinese university. And then I transferred to computer science because it was one of the program requirements that you study computer science if you want to transfer to the U.S. And that's, that wasn't a really um, difficulty transaction for me from software engineering to computer science because at the entry level, the freshman and sophomore year, uh, it's all about taking uh, programming level classes and know the basic concept. So that wasn't a hard transaction for me, and I found I really loved doing uh, computer science um, when I was in Michigan. But the, thing, the part that I didn't really enjoy about the, the transaction here is the geographic information system minor requirement that I have to do if I want to transfer. So at that time, um, I discovered that um, if you can stay with the things that you like to do, you'll find your life really enjoyable. And I did have some struggle with the GIS 
minors. But I'm glad that I get over with it and I graduated with with that. So from that, I learned that um, doing things that you like to do is great, but sometimes you may need to do something that you don't necessarily enjoy, which I think is okay. You can actually uh, view it as a challenge to you and try to see if it can do something more than that. So from that, I learned, okay, I can do I can do GIS as as a minor. So um, after my undergrad, I went right into grad school. And before I started doing research in the uh, reinforcement learning field, I actually spent uh, my first semester in grad school in a project that's related to bioinformatics. Um, that's when the unpleasant experience started. That was uh, a really struggling time for me back in my first semester at WSU. Uh, I picked the bioinformatic uh, directions because the professor contacted me saying he has funding for that uh, project and he has a specific project that he needs someone to take over. And I say, okay, I do not know much about uh, about bioinformatics back then, and but there's money that I'll get paid and I get to do my PhD degree and I can graduate early and find a teaching job, which is awesome. And although I don't know much about bioinformatics, I say, well, I've done things like GIS. I can I can learn it. So I, I say, well, yeah, I'll 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 do it because I think I, I thought I can manage it, but turns out that the grad uh, research is very different from doing a minor that you don't like in undergrad, and I wasn't able to manage the uh, bioinformatics project. And during that few months, I was um, constantly uh, doubting myself if I can uh, ever graduate. And then I lost my directions for, for a while. So losing directions in a grad school, is, it, it's very dangerous for a grad student because you won't be able to graduate. And I ever thought, I even thought of um, if I should drop off, can I do this PhD at all? So that was um, not very pleasant. And from that, I've learned that um, although sometimes you have to take chance that, uh, to do things you don't like and give yourself a little challenge, but you still have to um, know where is your limit. You shouldn't take a research direction that you uh, cannot handle at all. It's going to make you miserable. And also I learned that you shouldn't be afraid to make changes because uh, while I was struggling with that, I decided that I can't do that anymore. I should put my feet together and go through this. So I started talking to people around my department. And luckily all the faculties and the grad student researchers, including um, uh, and our dean, they're all very supportive and tries to help me to solve my problems. And they point me to um, different faculties in our department and ask them uh, what projects they have and schedule meetings with me. So I really appreciate what they've done uh, to me to help me make this direction transaction. So I, I looked around and talked to people. And at that time, I didn't really have a very specific interest on what grad research I want to do. Um, but I have a, like a broader interest, say I want to do something that is practical, I will be able to apply back to my real life. So people tell me my current advisor, Dr. Taylor, is doing a ton of research in robots and reinforcement learning and also uh, collaborations with companies where you can actually build real products. So I talked to him and found myself really interested in this topic. And I think it was quite a coincidence, but uh, that was really lucky of me because by the time I made the transaction in 2015, it was the first paper about DQN came out. So I looked at that paper and found deep learning sounds really, really interesting and promising. So I got into the research of deep reinforcement learning. So I also mentioned a third direction I, um, I'm doing right now is the data science uh, project. That is something totally out of my personal interest. It's a problem that I observed from my daily experience, and I want to try to solve that problem. It's, um, I like to do a workout in our school gym, but it's always really crowded when I was there. So I thought, if there's a way that I can use machine learning to help make predictions on how crowded this gym will be, then if I know when it's going to be empty, then I can pick the best time for myself to go to the gym. So I came up with this idea and realized this idea falls into the field of um, 
data science, including collect your data and make your model and make predictions of your data. So I started this project, and my advisor is really, although it's not directly related to reinforcement learning, but my advisor is being really supportive and think it's a good idea that I can uh, help my school uh, in terms of the management and help students decide uh, what would be the best time for them to go work out. Uh, so that's how I come up with uh, what I'm currently working on, reinforcement learning, deep learning, and the data science project. So I think um, at this point, I've, to I've told you um, some good aspect of me choosing the direction and some uh, not uh, some bad aspect of me to picking a wrong direction like bioinformatics. If you want to start a uh, research, what do you think might be the most difficulties that uh, you probably don't want to do a research? What would prevent you from participating in a research? So maybe you uh, currently don't have a very specific area of interest or you don't know who should you talk to. Uh, maybe you're too shy to talk to people about your ideas or you worry professors are not supportive. So look at those um, options and pick the one that's closest to your impression. And um, based on your responses, oh, I can see people come in really quick. Oh, most people say, uh, say you don't know who to contact. And someone say, uh, you don't know much about this area. What if I look, sound stu uh, stupid or not intelligent? Okay, luckily for all these questions, um, I have invited two current undergrad researchers, the same people in the same station uh, state as you, to join this webinar today to share with you about their experience, uh, experience and they can answer your questions on who should you contact to find a project and what if I don't know much about this area? What should I do? Okay, let's uh, get them in. Hi, gentlemen. Take a seat. Okay. Hello, thank you for uh, joining us today in this webinar. And as you may see, we have a lot of concerns on the polling questions on they do not know how to pick their research or simply don't know how to get started. So how about you tell them a little bit about your current experience and give them advice in picking your undergrad here. So first, please introduce yourself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so my name is Nate Burley. Uh, I'm going to be a sophomore here at Washington State University, and I am currently majoring in applied mathematics. And I'm Skylar Norgard. I'm going into my senior year at Kalamazoo College, and I'm studying computer science and mathematics. Okay, so uh, the main concern based on the polling question just now is I do not know who to contact, or I don't, I don't know how to start a research. How do you guys start doing the research? Uh, personally, um, I was always, like back in high school, I was always kind of interested in artificial intelligence and machine learning and data science. I, I really didn't know how to get started. I was a lot like you guys. I didn't know who to talk to. I didn't know what to do. So uh, midway through my first semester of freshman year last year, I just got really curious. So I just started Googling WSU AI research. And I found... <laughs> yeah, Google is a great tool. Yeah. And I found the names uh, Dr. Taylor and uh, Dr. Cook, and I read about some of their work and some of their projects, and it sounded interesting. So I just emailed them and was like, hey, I'm a freshman. I don't know very much. Uh, I would love to get involved. And they actually had me come to a couple meetings where, uh, where grad students were giving their presentations uh, for their PhDs. And I got to meet a lot of other researchers, and then they told me about uh, the program I'm doing this summer, and I applied, uh, and I got it. So. Yeah, and I have kind of a similar story. I was always interested in math and computer science and kind of the intersection between those as well as data science and making sense of numbers and different things, but I didn't know exactly how to apply that or what I'd be interested in. Then at my school, actually, someone who had done a summer research program was giving a talk on machine learning, and I happened to attend that talk. I was really interested in what he was saying. Is 
seemed like that perfect mix of math and computer science, kind of like I'd been looking for. And afterwards, I just went up and talked to him and just asked, like, how did you get involved in that? How did you find those opportunities? And he just let me know about summer um, REUs or research experiences for undergraduates. So I also went on Google, looked that up, and just very quickly, like, did the little control F and search for anything that had, like, machine learning or data science is one of the keywords for the research areas and kind of just made a small list of there of programs that were interesting to me and then applied and got plugged in here. So. Okay, sounds like the first step you should do is Google. If you have an area of interest, Google that area and try to find the top people that popped out around your university or even in a different university. Um, so what, uh, you've been working uh, the whole summer here, right? What, can you say a little bit about your project? Uh, yeah, so um, I am in the G-Share program, which is basically Jaren Technology, which uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, it is uh, technology uh, combined with gerontology, which is basically uh, building uh, technological, I guess, devices or things to assist the elderly and the disabled. So I'm on the RAS project, which is robotic activity support which uh, basically we're building a robot that will assist residents in a smart environment with performing various tasks. And uh, my specific project is computer vision. Uh, I'm basically helping the robot learn to recognize objects in its environment. And then once it says, hey, I know what that is, it'll draw a box around it and then place a marker on the map so it can then remember where the object is in the environment. So if the resident needs to, say, find their pill bottle or they can't remember where they left their toothbrush or something, they can ask the robot. <laughs> And the robot will either be able to show them or go and retrieve it. That sounds really neat. So, Nate, did you start with a lot of knowledge in computer vision? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, like I said, I am going to be a sophomore, so I just finished my freshman year. And when I applied for the program, I was just finishing up my first introductory programming class. So, no, you do not need to be intimidated if you don't know much. I, like I said, I knew literally nothing about computer vision. I had a ton of reading and learning to do coming in. But uh, that's actually a really undervalued part of research is just the learning and the personal growth you have to do. That's research, too. Even if you're not, like, necessarily writing a paper or maybe, like, pushing the limit of your field, it, it's all research, and it's all good for the university, good for the professors, and good for you. And my topic this summer has been deep learning, and in particular, doing that for human activity recognition from accelerometer, gyroscope data on either an iPhone or an Apple Watch or something like that. So being able to take raw accelerometer sensor data and then from there be able to classify a certain activity that someone's doing. And I know one main application of this is um, with physical therapy, kind of like holding people accountable. So if someone says, oh, like do this many jumping jacks, like this many stretches, blah, 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 throughout the week, actually having a way of tracking and saying like, yes, you did do that or no, you did not do that. So that's an application and there's a lot of other like healthcare applications as well with that. So kind of along with that, I've been exploring transfer learning and active learning as well in settings where you may not have a lot of data for a new subject or a new sensor location or something like that. So that's been my area of study. So did you start with a lot of knowledge in that? Uh, again, not very much. Mm -hmm. I've taken one machine learning class. Like my, my school happened to offer it the spring right before I came here. So I had like a very limited knowledge and kind of knew like what neural networks were and like what machine learning was, but very little like context specific knowledge. So there was definitely a lot of teaching myself and early on learning. But yeah, they, like the professor and the graduate students I'm working with did a good job of just meeting me where I was and giving me a project that was challenging but not too far off my head at the same time. That sounds uh, really good. Um, so it looks like uh, if you don't, for those of you who don't know how do you get started and who do you contact, you can Google and find the professors around you and feel free just to send them an email and usually professors are all very supportive, right? In responding to mm -hmm. your email, they yeah. won't say like, you're just a freshman and you don't know anything, get out of here. They won't do that. They'll be supportive, so don't be afraid to ask around of you. And also participating in different events can also help, like 
Skylar said uh, he went to a talk where people talk about machine learning and then he speak to the uh, speaker and find out the opportunities about here. And um, for those of you who is worried that you don't know anything about this field, it's totally okay. There will be self-learning involved, like when they just um, said. And Skylar has some uh, background there, but uh, through the research programs, you're, you're keep improving yourself. So um, just to recap everything uh, into a more uh, logistic way. So first, um, when you try to pick your direction, I would really recommend, of course, your interest comes first. I learned that from my own example that I like doing computer science, but I don't like doing bioinformatics. So if you know what you're interested in, you definitely go for your interest, like either machine learning, computer vision, robotics, anything that you want to do. And even, uh, but I want to emphasize that even if you don't have a very specific interest at this point, you should still just try something new. Maybe you will find that you will like it, or at least you will know that you dislike it, right? Yeah, uh, I was just going to, if you don't mind me jumping yeah. in, I was going to so, say, for me, like, even going into this project, I kind of knew I, I wanted to do something with machine learning, but I didn't know exactly what. So originally they had me doing uh, something with uh, autonomous navigation where the robot then learns its environment. And I was working on that and I was like, this is, it was interesting, but it just wasn't really clicking. Uh, so then I pivoted to computer vision. I've really, I've really enjoyed that. So I think the moral of that story is that your professors are definitely willing to work with you. And if you try something and you don't like it and you're honest, you're like, hey, I'm just, this isn't clicking and I'm just not liking it. They will totally let you pivot to something else. Don't so, be afraid to make a change. Exactly. Yeah. Don't be afraid to ask for a change. So the second, uh, if you find a field of your interest, the second step is to contact a professor who's inside your field. So um, one thing I want to point out is uh, you should, if you are taking any any kind of CS class, uh, if you don't know who to contact, the very first contact point should be uh, could be your current CS professors because they've been teaching this class for a while and they know everybody in the department. And you should uh, go talk to them and they should be able to point you to the right people, or maybe the professor, uh, it's uh, him or herself, is doing a research that you're interested in, so you can just start from there. And um, other methods they have taken is to browse, uh, to search for faculty and uh, visiting labs and joining labs meetings so that you can uh, discover who you should work with. Yeah. Do you have anything yet? <laughs> um, nope. Okay, yeah, yeah. so once you find the project, uh, the, pro uh, the professor you want to work with, the second thing is to, uh, the third thing is to find the project you want to work on. So you should, uh, of course, de de uh, discuss with the professor, but um, uh, you can, there are two approaches you can take. The first one is you can try to do some brainstorming with your professor, and maybe he or she will have some grad students doing different um, projects, and you can uh, just pick from a list. Or you can come up with your own idea, like my experience with my uh, data science project. Um, so uh, the professor are usually very supportive in you exploring your own idea. Um, I think both of you starting from scratch on your current project, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. And then just kind of add a little bit on um, what you said there of like, yes, working through different things. I, I know initially, like before coming out here, I was communicating with my professor and there are kind of two different areas. One was more machine learning based and looking at transfer learning and active learning. And the other one would be developing more of a tool for a certain like bioinformatics project. So no I kind of, yeah, <laughs> I was in the same boat. I, so I, I kind of had an opportunity to like read through some papers and like a little bit of research on both and decide which one I would be more interested in. and. Bio has never been my favorite area. So I just to say that we're not saying bioinformatics is bad. <laughs> yeah. It's totally good, just it's not good. Exactly. It's just different fits for different people. Yeah, and then, yeah, right. yeah, we're yeah. not saying don't do mm -hmm. bio. You should try to do bio. You're better than me. Yeah. So that was nice to be able to discuss things. Then once I got here and had kind of settled on machine learning, I also had time to like explore a couple different avenues with it and find something that I was interested in and very much like suited like my skills as well as far as what I learned in the class I took before coming out here. So yeah, yeah there are kind of two tiers of that of just discussion and brainstorming and everything. Yeah. 
So if you are able to start a project just on your own from scratch, that's great. But most of times, well not most, sometimes you will have to jump into a pro uh, project that everybody else has been doing. So in that scenario, you may be able to figure out what the current stat of that project is and figure out if you will be able to pick up from what uh, it was uh, left on and be able to uh, continue in developing it. So knowing the stat of an ongoing project is really important uh, when you try to pick one. Um, so when you are trying to do undergrad research in terms of the expectation, I think it will be a little bit different compared to the research, uh, choosing research direction in grad school, because research direction for, for grad students is extremely important that you have to uh, uh, use a long, a long time to develop through it, and that will eventually become your career. So uh, from my perspective, when I'm doing my grad uh, research, there's a little bit slightly more pressures on it, because you need to think of getting a good result and publish paper because your life will depend on it. But I think from the point of uh, doing undergrad research, uh, it's a lot more fun in it, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, undergrad research is, uh, I've had a really great experience with it. Uh, like she said, I've de uh, there's definitely some studying that will have to go in, I'm depending on, I guess, on your knowledge coming in. Like I said, I knew like pretty much nothing going in, so I had a lot of reading to do. I probably spent the first two or three weeks just reading papers and kind of trying to figure out what everything was, like how all the pieces of the robot interface with each other. And then once I settled on computer vision, uh, there weren't really any people in the lab who kind of knew how to do that. There, there was some older kids who, uh, some master's students, I believe, who had been working on it a little who kind of helped me along the way and got me going but for the most part it was sort of uncharted territory so I just kind of had to just figure it out as I went and uh, yeah yeah and I kind of similar for me where I came in and did a lot of self-study but I I enjoyed it because what I realized is that like I couldn't just devote so much time to um, just to really diving into a certain topic that I was interested in. And like that was like the primary focus for a while was doing that. So I thought that was very enjoyable. And kind of with that comes into the idea of just the fact that when you're doing research, like you're very much independent in a lot of what you're doing. And especially when it comes to reading papers, and expanding your knowledge, it's not necessarily like, oh, we need to complete this task and like write this. It's more open-ended, I guess. So just like, being able to stay motivated in that and like setting aside time so you can adequately learn what you need to learn is very good. But at the end of the day, it's like it is a fun experience and I've definitely learned that you shouldn't get too caught up in getting a certain result or anything like that, but just to enjoy the process of the highs and lows of what you're testing and just the opportunity to learn and to meet other people who are interested in the same things as you are, which is another very valuable aspect. Sounds like you guys are having a lot of fun. Right? Mm -hmm. so the I, hate to, thing, I hate to break in because you guys are, are hitting so many great points, and uh, what better place to end than maybe talking about how fun it is to learn and how fun it is to do research. So we're going to have to move on to, to kind of our survey part right now, but I do invite everybody to also remain online for the, the chat, which we can continue for about another 20 minutes and in particular be able to answer some of the questions that, that are coming up. So if I could ask you to just... If questions that you uh, want to ask for these two gentlemen, they will be around for a little while to answer questions. Awesome. Yinshu, could you just go forward two slides so we can have the, the feedback slide up for people to see? Uh, oh, this one. I... one more. There we go. Um, so please do, if you're a participant, complete our feedback survey. You can take the survey by going to, to the link that you see on the screen or using the QR code. You can also click the link that you should have received in your chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. We do take a, a lot of interest in your feedback, and in fact, the topic of this particular session came from feedback we've received on earlier town halls. So if you can take just one to two minutes and give us some feedback, that would be absolutely amazing. And if you can advance one more slide, please. Do also mark your calendars. Uh, on the, September the 28th, we'll be having our next virtual undergraduate town hall. 
that will be about inferring user contacts from smartphone data. Pratit Bhargava will be joining us to discuss that, and she'll also talk about the graduate school application and admission process, which is really timely because if you're thinking about grad school, that would be something that um, you would probably be starting to do around that time. And if you could advance one more slide, please. CRAW does have a lot of resources available, so we really do invite you to visit the website, visit the virtual undergraduate town hall part of the website, and you can see previous recordings of earlier sessions. We'd love if you join our mailing list so you find out about our programs. And we really do hope that um, you've enjoyed this virtual undergraduate town hall. I know I've learned just a ton from, from everyone who's been involved. We do want to continue the conversation, so if you can join us for an online chat with Yinshu after a concluding comments, you'll be able to ask some of the questions that maybe you haven't got an answer to yet. We really do appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us, and please do stay online for, for the chat. So thanks again, Yinshu and, and colleagues, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next virtual undergraduate town hall. Thank you, Gail.